This program is made possible by the Rouse Company Foundation. The Writing Life presents Roland Flint talking with W.S. Merwin. Welcome to The Writing Life. We have the pleasure today of spending some time with W.S. Merwin, a wonderful American poet who is with us for a few days. Thank you, Roland. Nice to have some uh, time to be with you here. Mr. Merwin was born in New York City, grew up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and was educated at Princeton. Now he lives for much of the year in Hawaii on the island of Maui. His first book of poems was published in a series that has launched many distinguished uh, careers in America, the Yale series of younger poets. And uh, like James Wright's first book of poems, it was selected for that series by W.H. Auden. Uh, in 1970, his book, The Carrier of Ladders, won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for that year. And he's had many other awards, including a Bollinger Prize in Poetry, and most recently, the Tanning Prize in Poetry. This is the first of that name. It is to be awarded annually to a master American poet. Uh, to begin with, it's probably of some interest to lots of people who, who uh, have heard about this prize. And of course, the news goes everywhere with a prize this size. Uh, it's in of interest to people. And in fact, it is to me to know uh, what this will do for you as a writer. Since I don't have a, a regular income and never have, and never, never have had lived on a salary, that's always been a mixture of writing and reading and, and luck. Uh, and translation. And yes, uh, I think it will, it will give me a measure of the illusion of, of uh, a little bit more uh, security. In, in, but I, I don't imagine we'll do anything spectacularly extravagant with it, uh, it'll be there to, to, as a sort of buttress to our, we love the way we live, you know, in the country and with the garden. And uh, we'll prob probably take a trip of some kind, but uh, we haven't got it worked out yet. Probably if it changed your lives uh, terrifically, it might be bad for your writing. Who knows? Might be. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and I never uh, know what's good or bad for your writing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Denise Levertov who, after all, I'm sure it was she, uh, uh, she won one of the first NEA grants, and she was asked what she did with it. She said, I bought a dryer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I thought that was very good for my writing, to have a new dryer in the laundry. Um, well, I'd like to hear some uh, poems from you today and, uh, and talk about uh, a couple of things that are, have been on my mind. According to an article in the Washington Post, you spend a good bit of your time on Maui at your home gardening. and. Uh, I, I know from your poems and from hearing you talk in other contexts that you have an abiding interest in the, in the environment, in the natural environment. I wonder if you see any connection between uh, doing your own gardening and, uh, and that interest, uh, or between that interest in the environment and your gardening and your writing. Do you tie all these well, together? Well, I do. And, and of course, inevitably, I, I work in the garden every day and the whole of the weekend. Uh, and of course, I'm thinking about those things all the time. I'm trying to trying to figure out the 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 what you're doing there is you're being in an environment with other kinds of life, and uh, I'm always wondering what really is the role of a human being in this place. Obviously, you can't have a garden without human beings, and it is a human presence. But the illusion of control is an illusion. You don't really control it. And uh, you shouldn't really control it either, I don't believe. Uh, the, I should say that I can't say very much about what kind of garden it is, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not a little garden plot with, with annuals in it, although you know, it's nice to have annuals, and I have some. We, we have some. But um, back in the 70s, I managed to get a piece of ruined land with, with my parents' savings. They, after they died, and uh, it was land that had been wrecked by by agricultural abuse over, and finally abandoned as worthless. And that's how I managed to get it. In a way, I'd always wanted to have land like that. 
uh, because to me, one of the things of having a garden is to say to myself, it's all very well to talk about the environment, but if you had the custody of a piece of land for a few years, how would you treat it? I mean, what would you do with it? How, if you, 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 can, you can say what you think the Brazilians should or should not do, or what should be done with the forests of the Northwest, but if, you've got, if you have the, uh, the well-being of a piece of land in your charge, what would you do? And uh, that's, in a sense, garden, that the garden is trying to answer that question all the time. So you feel something like a caretaker of this little I plot? Do. Yes, I don't. Yes, I don't know that I feel that we really own anything. Of course... Temporary, uh, temporary custodians, huh? I think people in, at one time had the illusion, just as writers did, you know, in the Renaissance people thought they wrote for posterity, they wrote for the future, they wrote forever. It's nice to think of. It's nice to think that people in a hundred or five hundred or a thousand years will be reading your work with real understanding and real sympathy and really getting it. And, you know, maybe if, if we look at things from the point of view of heaven, that's, that's what heaven will be like. But I, I think we can't count on that kind of thing. We're, we're writing for each other. And, and, uh, and the same thing with a garden. At one time, people thought of a garden as something that would last forever. Gardens. You know, you know, but uh, gardens don't last forever. They're very... Uh, Musso's great gardens from the 13th century in Japan that now have become moss gardens. You know, he, Musso never thought of moss growing in the gardens. Huh. He, he, grew, he grew them. He, he planned these wonderful gardens to be different, and they've, they've evolved uh, as, uh, as everything does. I think liter literature, poems evolve in the course of time. We probably don't hear Shakespeare the way Shakespeare heard him. Or Almost certainly, they heard, Elizabethans heard it differently. Um, and I, I think of James Wright saying in a, in a, in a verse epistle that, uh, on friendship, that neither of us knows whether our poems will survive this one day of our lives, but I have time left to, re to remind you of my devoted friendship. It's, uh, you, it sounds like you taking that relationship with the land have a devoted relationship with it without any illusions that your mark on it will last forever or that it's yours forever. No, I hope it will because I'm growing and we're growing on the land. I'm saying I'm growing it because the nursery part of it is what, what I do <coughs> and, uh, and, the, and all of the heavy part. Uh, I'm growing uh, when it works out, when it's possible. Uh, seeds of endangered species and of, and of and in some cases species that exist now only in cultivation. They, their habitat has been totally destroyed. And uh, the hope is that eventually some of those habitats will be allowed to return if they will and that then from cultivation, from botanical gardens and from gardens like ours it will be possible to supply seeds and plants of those species to go back uh. into them again. And that's happened. That does happen. Yes, I know. That's wonderful. <coughs> and there have been animal species recovered as right. well. Same thing. But you, it sounds a little like uh, Kunitz in that book we were talking about, Next to Last Things, <clears throat> in which he talks about gardening. And he talks about his relationship to the creatures there and how uh, honored he is when they seem to admit him to what is, after all, their habitat yeah. and not his. I feel that very much. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the wonderful things, this, as I say, was a, a, a wrecked piece of land. It had been eroded, and, and the soil had been ruined, and so forth. And that's fascinating to find ways of restoring this. And there were very few kinds of things growing on it. There were some imported grasses that had gone into weed and, and so forth. And uh, uh, one species of weed tree from Brazil that had turned into thickets in, in the lower part of the land. And, uh, but now we have many, many kinds of life, many kinds of what, what we now call biodiversity on the land. And the marvelous thing is you turn corners, and as, as a quantity of, of variety uh, exists there, uh, other forms of life, animals and birds, and, find it and, and move back in and feel at home there. And that's lovely. It's wonderful. Well, we want to hear some poems. And uh, it occurs to me that the first poem in, in, in your book, The Rain and the Trees, uh, has some nature in it and, and moves into the relationship to the human. It's a love poem. Huh? Yes, that's a relation to the human, isn't it? <laughs> it's called Late Spring. 
coming into the high room again after years, after oceans and shadows of hills and the sounds of lives, after losses and feet on stairs, after looking at mistakes and forgetting, turning there thinking to find no one except those I knew, finally I saw you sitting in white, already waiting. You of whom I had heard with my own ears since the beginning, for whom more than once I had opened the door, believing you were not far. It's lovely. In connection with the, pro the prose, I heard you say recently that uh, you don't think there is such a thing as a prose poem, but there are poems in prose. Would you say a word about that? Well, well, yes, I don't mean to belabor it and get sort of, I'm not a critic and I, I, don't, I can't speak of those things with uh, that kind of authority, but when you say prose poem, it's as though there were such a thing. It's as though, you know, this was a, a fixed genre, and you, you, knew, you knew what constituted a prose poem, and that you could write that kind of thing. When you say a poem in prose, it means that you're trying to write a poem, and you're doing it in uh -huh, prose. That's uh -huh. quite different. And that, uh -huh. and that means there really aren't any rules. Whatever a poem, whatever you think a poem is, is what you're trying to write, but prose is the medium in which you're trying to do it, rather than verse. And uh, I think the, the difference may seem slight, but I think it's no, an important No, I see one. the difference. Yeah. Mm. You're not talking about poetic prose, you're talking That's about right. uh, yeah. a poem. Because sometimes the prose, sometimes the prose is very, very direct and plain. And yes. I think of, I think for example of uh, uh, some of the short fragments of uh, Kafka, uh, they certainly would qualify for what, what I would call a poem in prose, and they're not prose poems. Right. Mm. Well, let's hear some, some more poems in any form. Well, you mentioned another one that goes with the one I just read. Um, one called West Wall. There are three poems that are, are together, at the be love poems, at the beginning of The Rain and the Trees. In the unmade light I can see the world. As the leaves brighten I see the air. The shadows melt and the apricots appear. Now that the branches vanish I see the apricots from a thousand trees ripening in the air. They are ripening in the sun along the West Wall. Apricots beyond number are ripening in the daylight. Whatever was there, I never saw those apricots swaying in the light. I might have stood in orchards forever without beholding the day in the apricots, or knowing the ripeness of the lucid air, or touching the apricots in your skin, or tasting in your mouth the sun and the apricots. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, apricots and the skin image I love very much. Please, more. Well, you know, uh, you talked about the connection between these things that I, I hesitate to find, to, to use any of the words for. What we call the natural world, that's not a very good phrase because it implies that there is a non-natural world and that somehow the natural world is separate from us. And that's the very point I really want not to make. But the moment you talk about Apricots and skin, you're making, this, you're making the point that with the metaphor that, that the rest of life and, the hum, and our human perception are, are really the same. And I think th that our, our losing sight of that is part of the terrible problem that we find ourselves in at the moment as a species, as, as our humankind. You know, the, we cut ourselves off from that, from that realization. So we find ourselves in a place that is false, and dangerous and, and increasingly destructive. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. it, from the way you say it, it sounds as if you might mean as so far as we're cut off from the rest of the world, what, what sometimes is called a natural world, the more cut off we are from ourselves. I think that's true. I really think that's so. Mm. And I think, you know, the funny thing is that once you start thinking about that, you realize that we, we I'm talking about poets and writers and, and people who who practice the arts, and perhaps by extension everybody, has always known that. And that the, that the distinction which we cling to, it seems terribly important to us to make ourselves superior to the rest of life, but the distinction we really know is a false one. And it's, a, it's one that belittles us. It's one that, one that uh, is very hard to live with. It may make us feel comfortable and secure, but then we feel insecure in the security, don't we? I mean, uh -huh. look, look how paranoid 
people whose whole lives are, are devoted to security become. You know, it's al it's almost inevitable, isn't it? If you devote your life to security, you become paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> Retke has that poem about the snake in which he says at the end, I long to be that thing, that pure something form, I forget the word. Sensuous that, form. Pure sensuous form, and I may be someday. Yeah, a lovely poem. Trying to recover that. I cry, the loved fox and the wren, do you remember that? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's, 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 it's that same recognition, and uh, you know, the arts are about recognition, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Ellen wanted me to read this poem, which is another love poem, called The Solstice. They say the sun will come back at midnight, after all, my one love. But we know how the minutes fly out into the dark trees and vanish, like the great ohias and the honey creepers. And we know how the weeks walk into the shadows at midday. At the thought of the months, I reach for your hand. It is not something one is supposed to say. We watch the bright birds in the morning. We hope for the quiet daytime together. The year turns into air. But we are together in the whole night with the sun still going away and the year coming back. More. More. All right. These are all from The Rain in the Trees. It's a wonderful book. It came out the same year as the selected poems, didn't it? Is that right? 88? I think, yes. That's yes. right. Yeah. Huh. Selected poems is getting hard to find. There are two little poems. You know, it's called The Rain in the Trees, and it's got this wonderful photograph by a uh, man I know in Hawaii of Hawaiian rainforest, which is different. You know, um, when you're thinking of rainforest, the image that most people have of tropical rainforest is a place with the, can with the great canopy up ahead and up above, and almost all the life is up there, the birds and the monkeys, and, and, and all, most things are up there. And uh, as you come down, uh, the life changes until on the, on the forest floor, there are a lot of ants, but mostly everything is being recycled in different ways. And the Hawaiian rainforest is quite different. They, canopy is much lighter, much more light comes through the canopy. And, and there's much more life down at eye level and down, huh. and down on the floor. And uh, wonderful birds, if you get up to the altitude where the natives are still there, but wonderful insects, a whole group of what they call happy face spiders. All of them have great faces on their abdomens with smiles on them. <laughs> and, uh, little, little lovely tree snails. And, well, these are two forest poems, and they're about some of the things that you were asking about. One is a very tiny poem. I know you love very short poems, Roland. It's called Witness, if you remember. I want to tell what the forests were like. I will have to speak in a forgotten language. And, you know, your, your question about the connection between writing and a garden and the feeling about the rest of life, I mean, trying to answer that in different ways, but the constant news of what's happening to the great forests of the world, which is, is like, a, to me, it's like, I, I feel it like an illness that I have to carry around with me. But it's a, it's a joy to be able to go out, not just and correspond or, or send $25 to the World Wildlife Fund, but uh, to go out and plant trees. And uh, almost every day I plant trees. And this is a, this is a great, it's a, maybe a small consolation, but it's a practical one. And it's one Very practical. Right. And planting seeds and most of endangered them, species. Most of, most of them are native trees. Uh, yeah. most of them. Place. On the last day of the world, I would want to plant a tree. What for? Not for the fruit. The tree that bears the fruit is not the one that was planted. I want the tree that stands in the earth for the first time, with the sun already going down and the water touching its roots in the earth full of the dead and the clouds passing one by one over its leaves. 
Well, um, I wanted to talk about one more thing and then maybe hear uh, some more poems in our little time here. I mean it when I said I was spontaneously and irresistibly elated to hear that you were receiving this big award. And, uh, and I, I've often felt this way uh, in the past when, uh, when Rita Dove got a Pulitzer and when Berryman got a Pulitzer and, uh, and when Charles Simic and Patricia Hampel and Galway Canal got MacArthur grants. You know, I just had a spontaneous uh, feeling of elation and, uh, and correctness. That it's happened far too seldom to you. Somet <laughs> that sometimes these things uh, go as, as they should do. And it reminded me of something uh, I heard you say recently, that, uh, that what we're doing is more important than the bickering that sometimes goes on uh, above it. And it reminds me of Robert Lowell saying, uh, he, he, he remembers someone who said poets really aren't competitive, and Lowell said, they are competitive. And I wondered what you well, think about that. you know, the fascinating thing is that if you compare, as Phil Levine did in that wonderful new book, The Bread of Time, in the essay on Berryman, uh, I don't mean to, to speak ill of, of, of Cal Lowell, but uh, Cal was competitive. He was extremely competitive. He used to play a game that bothered me very much of ranking everybody and deciding who was above who at that moment. And you always know where Cal Lowell was supposed to be in that hierarchy. And Berriman, Berriman who could be very cruel, uh, but the thing that drew, the thing, the passion behind Berriman was a passion for poetry. In which, in which individual talents, most of them were insignificant. The 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 uh, the standards were so high, and they were insignificant as far as he was, as far as he himself was concerned. I mean, if he th thought he did something did something well, that was fine. But he didn't necessarily think that everything that he wrote was was a glorious succession to William Shakespeare. Uh, uh, and he could he could be quite cruel to himself and to others on the subject, but it wasn't a matter of competition. It was, it was the, the passion for poetry itself. That's a very different thing. And I think that, I, th I said yesterday, I feel romantic about this. I really think that it, what, whatever all of the jealousy and bickering is and the competition, which, which keeps surfacing, but I think that we share something that's so important and we recognize that, that most of the time, we tend to be generous to each other. We do. I mean, if you find a new poem by someone you don't know, uh, and it's wonderful, I'm elated. I think I it's wonderful. I, I don't. It. I don't think. Oh, I don't like that. I wish I'd written it. You know, or something. I hate that person. I wish I'd written that. I just think that's that's. I mean, it just makes me feel terrific. I yeah. might think I wish I'd written it. Sometimes I do. <laughs> but yeah. I, but I don't resent the person no, that did it. I'm I'm eager for more. And I I I've, I've noticed since this amazing award came a few days ago. Uh, real generosity. I mean, sometimes you can, you can tell when the generosity is real and when it isn't. And, yes, I think that's and, true. Uh, and, it's, and it's been wonderful. It's made me feel that's been as, as important as the award itself. Well, that has something to do with you and your relationship to other writers, I think. I remember my daughter saying to my mother when she was visiting, uh, Darcy, the neighbor girl of the same age, calls you grandma and says she loves you. She's not, you're not the, her grandma. Why does she love you? And my mother said, because I love her. I think that some of this is uh, prepared by your relationship to writers in the past, if I may say so. And uh, what one wants is authenticity. <clears throat> one wants yeah. the real thing. And if you see the real thing, how can you, I mean, there's something the matter if you don't respect it immediately yeah. and love it, you know. And, but I also, you've got me thinking about James right now. He, I remember his telling when he was in high school and won the Robert Frost Award. He said, I heard him say that he went home. He didn't say he prayed, but he said when he was alone in his uh, crowded house, he said, oh God, am I going to get to be a poet like Robert Frost or Ben Johnson? That would be the grandest thing. He loved poetry. Yeah, he really did. Well, I think we should hear a poem before we, before we say goodbye. Well, I haven't read from the last book, Travels, and maybe I should, if we have time for one poem, I should read the last poem from Travels. Might, might even have time for two poems, I, I think. think so? Well, then let me read, well, read first a poem called One Story. It's a formal poem, as many of the poems in Travels are. 
and I don't want to get into this question of what's formal poetry and what isn't. It's a, this is a question that can, can take up the whole of almost any time. This is four stanzas and uh, one story. Always somewhere in the story, which up until now we thought was ours, whoever it was that we were being then, had to wander out into the green, towering forest, reaching to the end of the world and beyond, older than anything whoever we were being could remember, and find there that it was no different from the story anywhere in the forest, and never be able to tell as long as the story was there whether the fiery voices now far ahead, now underfoot, the eyes staring from their instant that held the story as one breath, the shadows offering their spread flowers, and the chill that leapt from its own turn through the hair of the nape, like a light through a forest, knew the untold story all along and were waiting at the right place as the moment arrived for whoever it was to be led at last by the wiles of ignorance through the forest, and come before them face to face for the first time, recognizing them with no names, and again surviving, seizing something alive to take home out of the story. But what came out of the forest was all part of the story. Whatever died on the way or was named but no longer recognizable, even what vanished out of the story, finally, day after day, was becoming the story. So that when there is no more story, that will be our story. When there is no forest, that will be our forest. I think we have time just for this uh, last poem. Well, this is a short poem. Uh, from the last group of poems and travels called After the Spring. The first hay is in, and all at once in the silent evening summer has come, knowing the place wholly, the green skin of its hidden slopes where the shadows will never reach so far again, and a few gray hairs motionless high in the late sunlight tell of rain before morning and to finding the daybreak under green water with no shadows, but all still the same, still known, still the known faces of summer, faces of water turning into themselves, changing without a word into themselves. Thank you, William. It's a great pleasure to be with you today and have some time together. And thank you for joining us for The Writing Life. Thank you.